Katie Hughes, and I'm a full stack engineer at No Red Ink. I started there about three months ago, and before starting at No Red Ink, I had done, let me stand closer to the microphone, one and a half side projects in Elm. <laughs> the half side project, I had gotten to the phase where I had to design the UI, and I thought, eh, I'll do that later. That was a year ago. <laughs> and now here I am at No Red Ink. And before this, I had done two years in React. So coming into No Red Ink with the most uh, Elm code I have ever seen, I asked myself a lot, where the Elm am I? <laughs> so backing up a little bit, or a lot of bit, I'm from Oregon. I grew up where the pink star is in Salem. I went to school down south in Corvallis, go Beebs. And then after college, I went up to Portland. And so I've always lived within this hour radius of where I grew up. I decided that as I would switch jobs to No Red Ink, I would also switch locations to San Francisco. So I packed up me, my cat, Erwin, and my mom, and we all flew on the plane to move me down south. I realized being in a new city at the same time I was in a new code base, that exploring one isn't too dissimilar from exploring the other. My learning goals for you are that at the end of this, you'll have two strategies for exploration and you'll understand how to explore mindfully. Let's talk about how you might explore a city. First, you start just walking down a block. And eventually you walk down some blocks and more blocks. You need to turn a corner at some point in time. And now you're on a street that originally you couldn't see from where you were before. You turn corners, you walk down blocks, et cetera, et cetera, until you get lost. But the thing about getting lost is that you learn while you find your way. Sometime during this process, maybe you'll go with locals, and through all this exploration, you get to know your neighborhood. And once you know your neighborhood, you get to know your neighborhood's place within the city. So spoiler alert, you can orient yourself in code in the same way. But Katie, what do you mean by orientation? That's the collective <laughs> audience voice. <laughs> it's uncanny. In real life, uh, orientation is can you get to where you're going? Do you know where you are in relation to the rest of the world? And in code, I think of it as, can you do what you're trying to do? Uh, do you know what you need to reference in order to figure out what sort of patterns do you need to use? Do you know where to find good things to copy and paste so then you don't have to think too hard about how to start a new test every single time? I also like this idea of cognitive maps from cognitive psychology. And a cognitive map is your mental representation of the world that you're in. It allows you to be flexible because think of two different people. One person has a printed out list of directions and the other person has a map. The person with the list of direction, directions will probably get it right the first time, but what happens if one of those streets they're supposed to turn down is under construction one day? The person with the map knows different possibilities and different ways to get to the same location. And that translates to code because the more you are aware of your code base, the more you're flexible of different patterns you can use and different things you can reference in order to get around and do what you're trying to do. So when do you need to orient yourself? Maybe you're in a new code base. Maybe it's an unfamiliar section. Maybe it's just been a while. Or you have pure learning purposes. For me, I had a code base and I had a purpose. I also had a job, so I had to like do work. <laughs> This is No Red Ink. If you're unfamiliar, we write software for English classes. And one of the things we do are generative grammar questions. Part of that is we allow students to say what they're interested in. So if a student's interested in Alexander Hamilton, we can say, Aaron Burr walked down the street, pick the verb. And that allows the student to be engaged because it's like, hey, piqued interest, that's a thing that I like. The interest page was one of the first pages written for No Ready, and my task was to refactor this out of Hamel and jQuery and turn it into Elm. And I started by walking down the street. I took the smallest thing on this page that I could turn into essentially a hello world function, and that was just the title. So we have welcome, select your interest below. Great, we're done. No. <laughs> Not quite. I expanded upon this a little bit more and created an NRI program dot program. That's a little, or a little bit uh, different, but that's just something we have internally to initialize error reporting and all of that good stuff. 
But we have a very basic init, which we'll see in a second, a very basic view, which we'll see in a second, and a model that does literally, or an update that does literally nothing. We have our init, which has our fake model, which is just sports. On the interest page, <laughs> on the interest page, we have different interest categories, and these are accordions that you can collapse that contain all the interests you can select. So sports here is representing like TV shows and movies. And then we have our very basic view. We have the same welcome text as before, and then we are mapping over our model to print out all of those interest categories. Great, now we can turn the corner. And once we turn the corner, this is where I like to think about expanding on the model and refactoring. Because I'm new to Elm, there, I don't initially know, like, how do I make good decisions in my model? And so by walking down the street, I'm going to eventually get enough context to now I can start thinking about how do I uh, shape my model in a useful way. And it turns out this is very easy because the compiler is going to help you through basically all of it. So this is how my model started. We have a list of interests. Great, that's sports or TV shows and movies from before. And then it gets a lot more complicated real fast. We're getting all of our interests from an API. So we have to model the fact that that data can fail. And that's what our GraphQL data is, holding, or is doing right now. And then we have a list of viewable interest category. That, map, that name is a mouthful, but this is uh, what it's representing. So we have the interest category, and then we also have the selectable interest. And then remember that the interest category is an accordion, so there's an open close state. So our viewable interest category is containing the is open for whether or not the accordion is open, as well as the interest category that holds all of the visible children. And it turns out that uh, you might want to interact with this page. So now we have to uh, model that ability to select some interests. And once you select some interests, they show up at the top. And you'll see that we display the photo in the two places. So initially, this is where my model ended up. We have interests, which is the same thing as before, and then selected interests, which contains the selectable ID and also the string for the photo URL. Now this is already feeling a little bit off because I am holding the photo URL in two different places, but we're gonna stick a pin in this and revisit the model uh, evolution in a little bit. First, it's time to get lost. And for me, getting lost was kind of building up Elm GraphQL decoders. I started by watching an internal demo that we had of our GraphQL client generator. It turned out that that wasn't focused on decoders, but they showed it on the screen for a second, so I paused the video, found something I could search for in the code, and that was selfreview.selection. And I found it. Great, this is what it looks like. Initially, I wasn't sure quite how to read this, so I took the great approach of just copying and pasting it and replacing their stuff with my stuff. <laughs> I poked it with a stick, let the compiler yell at me, read the docs some more, because turns out reading helps sometimes. I fought the compiler some more, read the docs some more, and eventually I won. So I turned their page query, their query.selection, into my query.selection. And by getting lost in GraphQL and writing these decoders up multiple times, I kind of learned how to build that intuition of what does this mean? And how does this translate to this GraphQL query? And this is how I made it sense to me. So we have query.selection and identity. Identity is just, what do you want to do with the stuff after you get it? Query.selection, I think of as these curly braces. You're starting a GraphQL selection. We don't know any details from there. Now we're going to query the interests. So let's throw interests into our query. We need a selection off of that interest. What was the selection before? It was curly braces. And now we're actually grabbing something from the interest endpoint. We're grabbing the ID. So we can grab the ID. We're finally at a valid GraphQL query, but there's a few more details I need. And so that's how we ended up with this GraphQL query. By exploring Elm GraphQL, reading through the compiler, reading through the docs, and getting lost, I found my way, and I found my way multiple times. So I could build up this intuition of how do I write an Elm GraphQL decoder. So our old code, our legacy code, was in Ruby on Rails, and our new code is in Elm. Both of those I didn't have much experience in. 
And so the thing that made this all so much less overwhelming was that I was going with locals the entire time. And by that I mean I was pairing. <laughs> My experience with Elm, in addition to the one and a half side projects, was that I read through Elm .tutorial, or Elm Tutorial org, and then I took their project and Frankensteined it into my own project and Googled things along the way. And that was enough to get stuff done, but there were some things I was still foggy on. One of those things was this line. Import sort dot set as set exposing set. <laughs> I couldn't figure out why set was up there so many times. Like I kind of had an idea like as is aliasing something, exposing is me hoping there's something from that library, but I didn't understand why set was used in both places. And so I just kind of threw up different combinations of this until the Elm compiler would be happy and I was like, great, moving on. By pairing, I was able to just ask, hey, why, why do we say set this many times? And my pair told me, as is aliasing the whole library as set, and exposing is grabbing probably a constructor. And because they're of different types, the Elm compiler is happy. Great. In a less than five minute conversation, I had something that before I didn't really know how to Google. And that is the power of pairing. <laughs> I also had the opportunity while refactoring this model to pair with Richard Feldman. And I told him, hey, I'm coming from React, so I'm coming in with those patterns and I don't know Elm patterns yet. So if you see things that could be done in a more Elmy way, let me know. And he did. So let's revisit that pin I stuck in the model before. Remember it looks like this. We have our interests, which is the GraphQL data, wrapping a list of viewable interest categories. The viewable interest categories are the accordion state, the interest categories, and the selectable interests. We also have the ability to select things where we see the photo in two different places. And so we have our selected interests, representing the selected ID and the photo. So you'll note that there is this comment, string is a photo URL. And there's this idea from UX that I really like, that if the user had to add a sticky note, that's a bad experience. And I kind of see this note as the sticky note in my model. It says, hey, I know that this isn't great, but I don't know what I want to do in order to make this better, in order to make this not dependent on my sticky note. And I paired with Richard, and we noticed that everything was uh, doing a lot of lookups, specifically around those selectable interests that I had nested so deep. So we refactored our model from this to this. It's already a lot simpler to read. We have interests, which is GraphQL data, same thing as before, wrapping interests, not the mouthful of viewable interest category. And then we have selected interests, which is the scalar ID. Our interests is the selectable interest by ID and the interest categories by ID. Because we have these two things pulled out, in order to look up the photo URL, we no longer have to know both the parent ID and the child ID. We can just look up selectable interest by ID. And the thing that makes this all work and not a ton of lookups all the time is that in the view we're using HTML.lazy. So we're memoizing all of those photos and kind of caching them. So now that I've gone through all of this growing up the model, I've gotten to know my neighborhood. I saw this uh, application go from a super basic program to a thousand plus line program to finally being broken out into main model view and update. Now you might think, a thousand plus line is probably too late to be, or probably waited too long to pull it out into the main model view and update. And yeah, I, I agree, it got overwhelming. But that teenage phase where the program was long and gangly was super <laughs> helpful to learn from. Because there was so much going on, I had to make decisions, where does this function live? Who does this type belong to? And by uh, thinking about those things, I naturally formed the divides of the main model view and update. So once I pulled them out, it was a lot easier. And in addition to that, by having everything in one place, I quickly learned how to tell what I'm looking at without necessarily having to scroll up to see, oh, this is the update function, or to look at the top of my computer and say, oh, I'm in model.elm. And by doing that, I'm quickly able to gain context. And the tool that I think is underrated for that, that 10,000 foot view, is the code map. This is from VS Code. 
And this is my code map of my model. I know that the very first type in here is my model. And I know that this is filled with types because pink is what my syntax highlighter uses for models. I also see that there's one that's really long. And so that means that that type is probably kind of verbose, which means it's probably hard to explain. And I really want to keep my eye on that one, because if it's hard to explain, then maybe there's some weird data manipulation going on that could be clearer. And this is my update. I know that the first function in here, the yellow, because that's my function uh, in syntax highlighter, is my update. I see that the first type in here is my message. I get an overview of like how complex is my application here. Not too bad. I have a few effects. And I have a lot of let in blocks. I can tell that these are let in blocks because they short start with a short pink rectangle and end with a shorter pink rectangle. <laughs> the short let in blocks, I feel pretty good about. The longer let in blocks, I want to flag for possible refactors. But being new to L means I'm slowly building up my spidey senses for code smell. And so I, as I'm building this, I'm kind of building that intuition of, hey, maybe really long let in blocks might, might not be the best thing in the world. But while going through this overview, I'm learning the shapes that I want to expect. What are my norms and what are my outliers? And finally, we're able to get to know our neighborhood's place. And the most tangible form of this is my relative path. We have UI page join. I know I'm in the page directory because my application is a full page. And I know I'm in the join directory because that's who I am. That's my route. That's where my page lives at. So plot twist, this isn't the only code in the no red ink code base. <laughs> <laughs> We're able to pull a Missy Elliott and flip and reverse this whole process. <laughs> and now we can explore more code. Before we started with a small task and got bigger, now we can start at a high level detail and get smaller and into more details. We start with getting to know our neighborhood's place. So I found another application in the code base that's my neighbor, someone else who's in page. And this was admin slash announcements. I'm going to guess that admin slash announcements is the route for this application because join was the route for my application. And it turns out it's correct. <laughs> and now we can dive in a little bit deeper and get to know our neighborhood. We're still at that 10,000 foot view, and this is the model for this application. Their, or their model is a little bit longer than mine, but it's kind of relatively the same size. They have a lot of helper types that are kind of verb a, a lot of things going on in them. And like I said before, yellow is my, fun uh, is my syntax highlighter for function. And so this is a function living in their model. And this makes me wonder if, hey, maybe there's some functions that might want to live inside of my model, because right now I have none. And I can also tell that I know that blue is strings in my syntax highlighter, so I can assume that this is a something to string. And if you notice that this shape actually mirrors this shape. So this function is probably a whatever that type is to string, which makes allows me to guess that maybe that type is used for some sort of view or something that's going to be translated into the UI. And then we have their uh, update. Their messages are a little bit more than mine, and we see a lot of let end blocks here, which kind of makes me feel a little bit better about my let end blocks. <laughs> we also see a really long update, which I'm kind of skeptical of, but it allows me to say like, hey, other people write really long update functions too. And going through this, I'm establishing expectations of what might be interesting once I start diving into the code a little bit more. What were those outliers I wanted to dive into? And so now we can go with locals. And of course you could pair and get an overview, but I also think you can pair with the tests. The tests contain, hopefully, human readable sentences in them. So why not use those? There weren't that many tests for this endpoint, but there were two. Should, the first should find the first announcement in edit mode and nothing when not in edit mode. So from those two sentences, I now have three assumptions. One, announcements have edit modes. 
Two, when they're in edit mode, you should see them. And three, when they're not in edit mode, you shouldn't see them. So that gives me a little bit of context before I dive deeper into the code. And now it's time to get lost and find your way. And by that, I mean break things. While you're breaking things, did they break like you expected? Did you see the compiler errors you were expecting to? And did they break the tests that you expected? And then once you're breaking things, you can dive deeper into the detail and turn the corner. You can start solidifying your understanding by making assumptions and breaking them. And I think of this as making predictions while you're reading a book or making a hypothesis before a science experiment. What you're doing is engaging uh, with the code at a deeper level that will allow you to understand it and learn it a little bit better. And then finally, you walk down the block. You get to slowly go through and see the details. What was unique in this part of the code and what patterns did you see reinforced? It turns out while I was giving this talk to my coworkers that it was really interesting that I chose admin announcements because this was another person's first LMAP. <laughs> but the point of this exploration is that you're not going to be making your assumptions of patterns declared in stone based on one thing that you saw. You're starting to build up the average of things that you see as you explore the code base. So we saw one application grow up and we explored another and we started very small detail and got bigger and then started at a high level and got more detailed. And I think of this as go. You just get going. To continue with the exploration method, I think of this as like exploring in a video game. You wake up in a town you've never been in and you have a task. Go. <laughs> when I moved from Oregon to California, I couldn't just go out and find an apartment because I was in another state. <laughs> so I started by studying first. I started at looking at Google Maps and trying to get an overview of what does San Francisco look like and asking people, hey, what neighborhood should I be looking in until I got more and more detail and I could finally be in San Francisco to call people on Craigslist. And while I was making this presentation, I realized that Google has maps, but GitHub has code. And maybe you're like me, and you're a little intimidated by open source. You could take this study first method and kind of get a shallow idea of a few different things until something sticks. And you look at it at a high level and get deeper and deeper until you build that confidence to pick something up, pick up a small task, and then learn by doing. So these are two different methods. We have go and study first. But what they both have in common is that the step that you're on has been informed by the previous step. You're building off of assumptions that you've been making. And the moral of the story here is to explore mindfully. Take in as much input as you can through as many methods as you can and make predictions as you go. And eventually, you'll know where the elm you are. <laughs> Thank you so much.